Tonight, the massive storm barreling through the Atlantic. Hurricane Lee becoming the most powerful storm of the season. Right now, packing winds of more than 150 miles per hour. The threats to the East Coast, even if it doesn't make landfall, could another storm system change its course? Body cam released today showing the chaotic moments of a deadly police shooting. Now a former Philadelphia officer charged with murder. We'll explain how the new video contradicts the first police report of the incident. The convicted killer still on the run in Pennsylvania, evading police now for nine days. Today, a tower guard at the prison is out of a job, failing to catch the escape. Why this suburban manhunt has gone on for so long and what we know about how he hid from police before in the jungles of Brazil. The Trump campaign's wake-up call in Iowa. His allies worried Trump's ground game isn't working, especially against his rivals, even though polls say the former president leads the race to replace Joe Biden. Will it be enough for 2024's first caucus? Deadly floods paralyzing Hong Kong tonight after a black storm warning. High water swallowing cars, washing away roads, neighborhoods completely underwater after the heaviest rain ever recorded pounded the city. We'll show you the search and rescue efforts tonight. New video showing an elite federal prosecutor on the wrong side of the law, trying to leverage his powerful position after a hit and run, even showing officers his business card after crashing into another car. What that officer said back to him about being caught on camera. The new warnings to update iPhones worldwide immediately. Apple just pushing out a, a patch for a significant security flaw. What you should know about the Pegasus spyware and whether you're being watched. Top story starts right now. And good evening. Tonight, all eyes on Hurricane Lee. Right now, as you can see here, it is a Category 4 storm packing maximum sustained winds of 150 miles per hour. This storm went through a rapid inten intensification we rarely see. Wind speeds doubled this week. Look at this, growing from a Category 1 to a Category 5 in just 24 hours. Only six other Atlantic hurricanes on record have done that. Right now, the storm doesn't look like it could make landfall over the next few days. There's only so far our tracking models could predict Lee's path. But the consensus is the storm could turn north. Whether it barrels into land or stays offshore, what threat does it pose to the eastern seaboard? Those are all questions we want to ask. To answer that, we have the one and only Bill Karens here, NBC News meteorologist. So, Bill, talk to us about the latest on the track and, and the spaghetti models, European, American, and we're going to go from there. Yeah, we can call this like hurricane patience or hurricane anxiety. It's these storms that come off of Africa far away from land, and then we just have to watch them. It can take 14 days at some point. And, you know, this one we've already been tracking for about seven days, and it's actually going to move even slower in the next couple. So let me go in a little more detail about what Tom was just explaining. So 11 p.m., this was 80 mile per hour, Category 1. Then it jumped, as Tom said, doubled to 160. Rapid intensification is a term that's used. You only have to get increase of winds 35 miles per hour in 24. So we doubled that. So that's like insane. So as far as the storm now goes, it's the category five. I think the thing that's important is still moving to the northwest at 13. That's kind of an average speed for a, for a tropical storm or a hurricane. But as we get to the middle of next week, this thing is really going to move slow from Monday into Tuesday, even into Wednesday. This is jogging pace, like six to eight miles per hour. And at this point, it's going to begin to take that turn to the north, Tom, and that's when all the questions begin is where is it going to go? Is it going to head up here towards Nova Scotia, possibly Maine? Is it going to harmlessly go out to sea? Our European and U.S. models are all kind of similar, but that's seven days from now. Um, so, Bill, I know you're also watching two different systems. We've been talking about this all week. If one wins out over the other, it, it could determine where the storm goes? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of as simple as that. So there's going to be a storm going over the Great Lakes. This is the middle of next week. If this storm is strong enough, it'll take Lee, it'll deflect it, and kick it out. But if this storm is weaker and the high pressure out in the ocean is stronger, that would steer it more north and doesn't allow it to escape, Tom. So that's going to be the big thing we'll learn middle of next week. So middle of next week, we should know who wins, yes. that, wins out in that fight. Okay. I know also tonight you're watching some, some pop-up thunderstorms throughout the Northeast and power outages. Yeah, we're up to 150,000 people without power. We've had ground stops from Boston to the New York airports to D.C. We still have numerous very strong thunderstorms that are rolling up here, one over Manchester. Boston's okay for now, but out on the Mass Pike, we've had wind gusts up to 70 miles per hour in New Jersey and a report of two-inch hail. So uh, this is the end of that heat wave, Tom, but we're paying the price. Yeah, people need to be careful if they're going to be out on the roads tonight. 
tonight. Bill, we appreciate you. Thank you. Now to the other major story we're following tonight. Breaking news in the Pennsylvania manhunt for the convicted killer who escaped from the Chester County prison last Thursday. The officer who failed to notice the escape now fired. George Solis is there for us tonight. Tonight, the prison officer who was on duty in the observation tower at the time of Daniello Cavalcante's escape has been fired. A Chester County spokesperson confirming to NBC News the officer, whose name has not been released, was an 18-year veteran of the Chester County prison and was terminated yesterday. At issue, according to the spokesperson, the officer had a cell phone in the tower, a violation of the prison's policy. Earlier this week, officials detailed how the officer failed to observe or report Cavalcante's escape from the prison, which went undetected for nearly a full hour. My best estimate is he, is in, he was within that perimeter. The area for the search shifting yet again after two more sightings, one Wednesday night, one yesterday at noon, both around Longwood Gardens. Many of our operations are taking place in that area right now. This map inside the Hunt's command center showing the eight square miles where a massive mobilization of law enforcement is tracking the five foot escaped inmate believed to be hiding in this densely wooded area. The same area where he was captured on a trail camera earlier this week. It's a tactic Cavalcante's used before following a murder in Brazil that he's still wanted for. Pennsylvania authorities saying after that crime, he hid out in the jungle in his native country before fleeing to the U.S. After the crime that he committed down there, he did something very similar to this uh, in the jungle down there. So uh, it's not surprising to me that he's able to, to last out there for a little while. Among the multiple agencies attempting to flush Cavalcante out into the open, the U.S. Marshals confident they will capture him. We're essentially playing a game of tactical hide-and-go-seek. Uh, we're looking for a very dangerous individual. Okay, with that, George Solis joins us tonight from Unionville, Pennsylvania, where he's been reporting on this story for us all week. So, George, authorities say they are now adding even more resources in response to these latest sightings. That's right, Tom. They are flooding this area with police, especially after reports of those multiple sightings. Around 400 officers from different agencies, local, state, and federal, the FBI, Customs and Border Protection. They really want to saturate this area, hopefully flushing Cavalcante out because they believe they can take him into custody. And this is the most manpower they've had here since this manhunt began. Tom? Hey, George, before you go, it's been nine days. Have those authorities given you at least a clear-cut answer of why it's taken so long? They usually go right back to their same sentiment that this is a heavily wooded area and that he has not broken that perimeter. They are confident that the more sightings they see of him within that containment, this eight square mile radius now, they're going to be able to close in. They are waiting for him to get tired, for him to get exhausted. They're still really, really confident, Tom. They're going to capture him one way or the other. Okay, we're approaching two weeks. All right, George Solis, we appreciate it. Next to Philadelphia, not far from there, were a police officer involved in a fatal point-blank shooting of a man in his car last month has now been charged with murder. As police body cam video of the encounter was released today, and it contradicts the original police report. NBC's Ron Allen has more. Philadelphia prosecutors say the newly released police body camera videos show the fatal encounter happened within seconds of officers pulling up to Eddie Irizarry's car. They are crucial evidence in the case, and in many ways they speak for themselves. Officer Mark Dial now faces murder and other charges for allegedly shooting to death the 27-year-old man who his family says loved music, cars, and had only a pocket knife in his hand. I just want to be remembered that <laughs> he was a good kid. And never was in trouble and loved his family. Dial turned himself in this morning, a five-year veteran who NBC News wrote along with last summer for a story about gun violence in the same neighborhood where he allegedly killed Irizarry. In a statement, Dial's attorney saying the facts will unmistakably show that Officer Mark Dial was legally justified in discharging his weapon while fearing for his life. Prosecutors say the body camera video of the August 14th incident contradicts the original police account, which said Irizarry was driving erratically, got out of his car, and lunged at the officers with a knife. Police later changed the details of that account. This video from a security camera obtained and released by lawyers for Irizarry's family also appeared to show Dial quickly exiting the vehicle and opening fire. His family said they wanted every frame of video released, some too graphic to show here, to prove police gunned down an innocent man. It appears he committed the cardinal sin 
of driving erratically. Death sentence is not called for for erratic driving. Tonight, Officer Dial already is suspended. The chief has said she intends to dismiss him. He has not yet entered a plea in court. Tom? Okay, Ron, thank you for that. Moving overseas now to the latest on that trapped American scientist in Turkey. After life-saving medical treatment, the cave diver is expected to make his journey to the surface very soon. Matt Bradley is in Turkey with the details on the long climb and what rescue teams are up against. Tonight, an American explorer trapped in one of the world's deepest caves could be just hours away from beginning his long journey to the surface. I'm doing well. Thank you. It's been nearly a week since a frightening illness left Mark Dickey stranded about 3,400 feet below the surface. Um, as you can see, I'm up, I'm alert, I'm talking, uh, but I'm not healed on the inside yet, so I'm going to need a, a lot of help to get out of here. He suffered severe gastrointestinal bleeding while on an expedition to map the Morka Cave, Turkey's third deepest. This is the mouth of the cave. You can see how steep it is, so rescuers have to rappel down and climb up multiple times a day. But they tell me this is the easy part. The Turkish rescue team says they're waiting for the all clear from doctors and rescue teams who are using small explosives to widen parts of the tunnel. This rescue will rank among just a handful of cave rescues ever attempted at this depth. Ender Uslogu was on the same expedition with Dicky when he fell ill. What makes it so uniquely difficult? Being deep and also being very cold uh, and it's long, it's so muddy, it eats up uh, the equipment so quickly. He says the American explorer is made of tough enough stuff to endure this ordeal. He is a perfectionist, mm -hmm. so that's what makes him unique. But now Mark's vast experience and resilience will face their greatest test. Matt Bradley joins us tonight from Turkey. So, Matt, do we know how long that rescue would be? Well, we're hearing that they're almost about to begin the rescue mission, the effort to try to actually cause Dickey to surface. But that could take three or four days. We understand that it could be something we're hearing different things, 15 hours to 40 hours for a healthy, experienced climber to surface from that depth. For someone who's being carried on a stretcher by some other means, someone who's really, really ill, it could be a lot, lot more time. So we're really talking about days, Tom. And then could you tell us or at least remind our viewers about Mark Dickey's condition tonight? Yeah, I mean, his condition, from what we understand, is completely stable. We spoke with some some of the, the heads of the people who are you know, running this operation. They said that he hasn't had a blood transfusion in the past two days, and that's significant because he took about four different uh, blood transfusions while he was really ill. Now it looks like he's more or less out of the woods. We saw this video of him where he was addressing the public, where he seemed fine. He reminded everybody that this was internal bleeding, and that's why he looks like he's totally healthy. There's a lot of risks involved in this. Um, he can't really press himself up against a cave wall or go around a sharp corner because that could aggravate his internal bleeding. So there are these risks. But when you look at him and when you hear from the people that we were speaking to at the site of this cave, it sounds like the medical situation is not nearly as severe as it was a couple of days ago. And they're about to give the green light for him to traverse to the top of that cave. Tom? We hope you're right. Matt Bradley in Turkey. Now to power and politics and some exclusive new reporting on the inner workings of the Trump campaign in Iowa. The former president still holding a commanding lead over his opponents in polls. But is that just an illusion? Sources telling NBC's Dasha Burns and our Catherine Doyle that the operation is lagging in Iowa and needs to turn things around in order to win the caucuses in January. Dasha Burns joins us now with more of her exclusive reporting. And Dasha, I want to start off with a quote from your article. Let's put it up on the screen for our viewers here. Here's what you write. They're not laying the groundwork well enough to feel secure going into the end of December as Trump deals with scheduled trials and other legal issues, as well as the January 15 caucuses approaching a source familiar with the campaign said. So I guess, Tasha, my question to you is where is this coming from? Because they lost Iowa to Senator Ted Cruz mm -hmm. back in 2016. I mean, obviously, during the general elections, he, he did very well in Iowa. Is it a false sense of confidence with the poll numbers? Well, over the course of about a dozen interviews that m me and my colleague Catherine Doyle did, there were a few key themes that became clear. Number one is just the general staffing and operation is lacking. Uh, one source telling me that there was just a lack of experience on the team, that they are not at the doors, which is where you need right. to be, because it, for a caucus especially, you're you not be just organized. Ma mailing in a ballot. you got to get people to go to sit in a room in January and talk to their neighbors, right? And you have 
have to be organized. Uh, they're not at these events that Republican parties are holding. You've got the Vic tables there. You've got Nikki Haley tables, DeSantis tables. Uh, the so Trump what, what is it in your there. sense, though? Are they just unorganized, or is it a, a false sense of hubris? It, uh, so my sense is it's, it's a combination of both. Yeah. Their, their poll numbers are, they're way ahead, right? They're ahead by 20, 30-plus points in most of these polls. And so they, the voters I talk to feel like maybe they're being taken for granted. And he's not showing up there, right? So they are relying on their campaign on the ground there to be the presence, but that presence isn't being felt. And the local and state officials that I'm talking to are saying that as well. They're just, they're seeing all these other campaigns, DeSantis, Vivek, yeah. and others at the doors, at these events. They're not seeing the Trump presence there in the same way. You know, another source told you, and I'll put this up for our viewers as well, Trump Jr. was concerned, obviously the, the former president's son, that they were running from behind yeah. and getting things going and that there was a concern about that at the highest levels, the source said, adding that they were giving DeSantis too many opportunities. Um, you, you obviously stand by your reporting here. D what is the Trump team now saying about all of your reporting? Yeah, so uh, Donald Trump Jr. is calling this 100 percent fake news, uh, denying that this call ever happened. But we did speak to yeah. one source who had a phone call with Donald Trump Jr. where he expressed those concerns. He felt like they were behind, uh, that there wasn't enough experience on the team saying multiple times to the source that they felt like they needed an adult in the room. And this source, by the way, that, that talks to me about this is a supporter of the former president. He says yeah. he wanted to tell me this because he's concerned that they're not doing enough and they he wanted to essentially give them a wake up call so they could change the operation there. So I know you're living in the bubble, right? And so you're reading all the reporting out there. You're talking with your sources. You're talking to your colleagues. I've heard that there's been a lot of reporting done on former President Trump and the indictments and the poll numbers, but there hasn't been a lot of deep dive reporting like like what you're doing here on the campaign. Is that true? Well, that's the thing. I think we're taking for granted when we're looking at the numbers and and the legal stuff is obviously a huge story and it's a, right. frankly a big distraction too and so people aren't really looking under the hood of these things and they're saying well he's way ahead so let's just focus on this other stuff but I'll tell you when I am on the ground in these places the national narrative versus what you're feeling and seeing and hearing on the ground and remember this isn't we don't do elections in one day, the primaries, yeah. it's not a national election one day, right? It's these early states that really matter. And there's a certain process here, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina. And what I feel in these places, especially Iowa, which is a really specific yeah. process, it just feels different. And the voters there are looking for something specific. And I hear over and over again, people want to see Trump, even people who are leaning, voting for him. It's a soft vote, yeah. meaning that they're not solid and they're looking at other options and they're kicking the tires of these other candidates and they want to see Trump and shake his hand and ask him questions. I will say this, having covered Donald Trump in 2016, he didn't have much of a campaign back then either. He had a plane, a microphone, and a Twitter account, and he was still able to win. But he so lost there's that. Iowa. He, he lost, he lost Iowa. Iowa. He still won, <laughs> so there's that. Anyways, Tasha, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. While Republican candidates battle it out in a crowded field, there's growing speculation among Democrats. Some party leaders seeming poised to jump into the 2024 race should Biden bow out. NBC's Chuck Todd asked California Governor Gavin Newsom about this shadow contest and whether he'd be prepared to run. Filing deadlines haven't passed. President Biden doesn't run. Why shouldn't we consider you a likely candidate? Well, I think the vice president is naturally one lined up, and the filing deadlines are quickly coming to pass. And I think we need to move past this notion that he's not going to run. President Biden is going to run, uh, and we're looking forward to getting him reelected. Uh, I think there's been so much wallowing uh, in the last few months and hand wringing in this respect, uh, but we're gearing up for the campaign. We're looking forward to it. I, I under, you know, but. You hear these calls privately. What do you tell these donors who are wallowing in this? Uh, time to move on. Let's go. Okay, that's what he told you. Uh, Chuck Todd joins us now, NBC News political director. Chuck, mm -hmm. I have two questions on this. The first being, let's take age out of the equation. Let's take a medical emergency mm -hmm. out of the equation. Would the poll numbers ever compel President Biden and or Democratic leaders to say, hey, we have to put somebody else on the ticket for November? I don't not as long as Donald Trump's the most likely Republican nominee. I think that in, in many ways, Biden and Trump 
are each other's strength within their own parties. Um, the idea that the other's going to be in the other, it, you know, sort of reassures, right, with Republicans, well, maybe he's not the best candidate, but he can be Biden, Biden looks weak, or, you know, it, it reassures, well, Trump is beatable, and, and that's what Biden folks say. If for some reason it was clear Trump was not going to be the nominee, I do think we'd have a different conversation, but let's be realistic here. I do not think any entity is going to force Joe Biden out. If Joe Biden decides not to go, it's a family decision. It means Joe Biden and the family, they got together and said, it's not worth it. You know, maybe it's not worth it with Hunter. Maybe it's not worth it with the president's health, whatever they, I do not believe it would be a political power, power broker from the outside that could somehow push him out of the race. It would, this is an internal family thing. I really and then, believe that. Chuck, we have a lot of questions tonight, but if you briefly can, can explain to our viewers, maybe remind them, what are the mechanisms if, if President Biden drops out pre-convention and if he drops out yeah. post-convention? Well, I, look, I think that realistically here is if he drops out before this calendar year, I do think you'd have a very active race Mo I think all of the filing deadlines would still be in front of you. Though if he gets, if he somehow got out in during the calendar year in 24, you know, like what happened with LBJ and and uh, and he got out in March of 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 that year. Primaries had already passed. Some filing deadlines had passed. Bobby Kennedy uh, got in the race. Um, and it was always going to it would guarantee that the convention would ultimately pick the nominee because there wouldn't there wasn't enough primaries to win enough delegates to pull it off. And I do think that's the ultimate uh, if for whatever reason Biden didn't seek reelection. Um, this becomes a convention contest. This will be, because uh, I think, unless it happens before the end of this calendar year. Yeah, maybe the most watched convention ever, if that were to happen. Um, Chuck, I do want to ask you, though, because this, this next question connects to it. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the president's age. We now have news that Speaker, former Speaker Pelosi is yeah. going to run for re-election again. If she gets re-elected and finishes out her term, she's going to be close to 90 in that scenario. You have the issues with Senator Mitch McConnell. How did we get to this point in politics? There was a time, and look, I, I covered politics. I covered presidential campaigns yeah. when age was a very important thing. I mean, yeah. even going back to Ronald Reagan, you know, um, even going back to Nixon and Kennedy. I mean, age has always been an right. issue. And now we're at this point where it's not that big of a deal. And I don't know if it's because health care has gotten better. I don't know if it's because yeah. the media has, has let this happen or if it's because people just don't care. I think health care has gotten better. I think, frankly, the ability to cover up the look of your age. I mean, let's be realistic here, right? Like, I think a Age is more obvious if your gray hair shows. Age is more obvious if you see uh, the natural uh, wrinkling of skin. And I, you know, I do think the fact that our our ability to look younger um, with all sorts of whether it's products or, or or surgery also means that it it isn't front and center to voters, right? So I think all of that factors in. Um, but I kind of think we're about to hit a tipping point on this. I really do. I am shocked Nancy Pelosi is doing this. I am shocked, given the Dianne Feinstein situation, that she's intimately involved in, right? Her daughter is essentially one of the, is helping with caretaking of Dianne Feinstein. So I, it, let me just put it this way, and I want to come across as an ageist here, but let's think about a democracy. These folks that continue to stay in power, they stay in and they rationalize it this way, Tom. Well, I'm too important. I, and I'm this. You know what? In a democracy, no one's irreplaceable. Because if someone is irreplaceable, we're not in a democracy anymore, right? There are no kings. There are no dictators. And feeding this notion that people are irreplaceable actually erodes away at the idea of democracy. So I, it really... I'm not a big fan of term limits. I think ultimately the voters should make all of these decisions. But I understand why more people want them when they see decisions like this. Chuck, it's such a, an interesting and powerful take on, on really a tricky subject. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of that, you know, you are one of the great minds, uh, at least of our generation, right? Um, great political minds. Sunday is going to be your last show moderating Meet the Press. We wanted to take a look back at some of your biggest moments. And, and one of them was an interview you had with former Vice President Dick Cheney right after the release of the Senate mm -hmm. torture report. Here's a clip. You said uh, earlier this week torture was something that was very carefully avoided. It implies that you have a definition of what torture is. What is it? Well, torture to me, uh, Chuck, is uh, an American citizen 
um, on his cell phone making a last call to his four young daughters shortly before he burns to death in the upper levels of the Trade Center in New York City on 9-11. Um, there, there's this notion that somehow there's moral equivalence between what the terrorists did and what we do, and that's absolutely not true. We were very careful to stop short of torture. Chuck, you know, your producers mm -hmm. turned us on to that clip, and I'm so yeah. glad they did because it sort of took me back in time, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and back in time to, to a different time in our business and maybe to a different time with Meet the Press and our leaders because, I mean, it, it shows the significance and the importance of that program. But, Tom, it's more the, the program can only succeed if elected officials accept the premise. Completely agree. Yeah. And this is why I wanted to highlight the former vice president. I've said this for years. And people always ask me, what's your favorite interview? And I say it, it was my hardest and favorite is the same. It's Dick Cheney during the torture report. Because, look, you read that whole transcript. Some of the most uncomfortable questions I've ever asked anybody, I asked of him. But he wanted to come on and say his piece and defend his case. And this was this 25-minute interview was respectful. It was tough. It got a little tense at times. Um, but he puts himself out there. And he wasn't afraid of this. This is who the Cheneys are. We got to know that even more, I think, uh, down the road when, when people got to know Liz Cheney. This was uh, essentially, I think, just before she, she got into Congress, if I'm not mistaken. But the point is this. I, I just I find our elected officials, if you care about this democracy, don't be afraid to go anywhere. And, you know, the, my final two guests are intentional in this case, right? It's Bill Cassidy and, and Gavin Newsom because those guys go anywhere. Whatever you think of Gavin Newsom, he'll, yeah. go, he'll go with Sean Hannity, he'll show up and meet the press, he'll show up on Rachel Matt, Maddow, he'll show up, he, doesn't, he goes anywhere, he's comfortable in his own skin, he defends his views, he gets himself out there. Bill Cassidy does the same thing. The second he votes to convict Donald Trump, he went on Fox, he went to these places. He, you know, that's, that's what a healthy democracy does. Right. We do our job, you come out there, you explain your views, we're skeptical of them, we make you defend them, and everybody's a better informed citizen because of it. I, I want to show you another clip. This is just video, but I want you to watch this, right? This, I'm told, was the first time you were on Meet the Press with Tim Russert. This is back in 2004. <laughs> You're explaining, I think, what a blog yeah. is. Look at Chuck Todd there. Oh, man. Look at that I, I look. Feel like I'm a seven, I feel like I'm a, <laughs> uh, uh, like a member of a 70s uh, failing rock band, you know? Two, 2004. And, Chuck, I wanted to play this for you because when you look at that guy, you yeah. know, and you think about that guy, and you were working at the National Journal, the hotline, which was right. very inside baseball for people that love political <laughs> journalism and really for, right. for people that worked in Washington. And that guy got to sit in that chair where Tim yeah. sat and he got to be the moderator. Only 12 people on this planet have ever been able to say that. I mean, when you look back, Chuck, that has got to be pretty amazing. That's the most I never would have thought that. Just getting on once was the thrill of a lifetime. And then I remember that when I got the sub, I couldn't believe that. And that was, you know, so look, it, it absolutely is. And I'm going to be honest, I'm never going to not miss being on Sundays. Okay. I fully, but I don't miss, uh, I won't miss having to miss a family event again. Yeah. Um, and you know, this is the perspective. I can tell you all the family events I've missed. I can't tell you the news events that were taking place for why I miss those families events. You get my drift, Tom? I totally like, get your drift. You know, we sit here, and, and I know we all have to make these choices in this business, and you have to do it, I have to do it, we've done it. Um, but there's a balance to all of it. And uh, I've done my time, and now I want to devote a little bit of time uh, to bigger picture things and, and showing up at homecoming at the University of Miami where my daughter's on the homecoming committee. That, that is I get to be there on a Saturday. That's amazing. I'm excited. Chuck, yeah. before we, we leave, I, I do want to show you these last two clips. I heard these were some of your favorite moments. Uh, the yeah. first, I believe, is uh, either the Stanley Cup um, yeah. or it, it's, it's when the Nationals uh, won the World Series. Well, I got to preside at Meet the yeah. Press when two Washington teams actually won something, right? The Nats and the, the Caps in 18 and the, and, the, and the Nats in 19. And, you know, our uh, parent company, NBC, uh, airs the Stanley Cup, which means we got to... I have to tell you, I'm not the biggest hockey fan, but the single coolest thing I've ever done is hang out with the Stanley Cup. Yeah. That is among the highlights uh, to, to be there in person. The line of people that just wanted to take a picture next to a trophy, and then we got the World Series trophy. I have to admit, those are the perks. Those are some cool perks. Yeah. You know, 
you know, we're both pretty big sports fans, and so to have have uh, that access every it, now and then it is, 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 it is no neat. doubt very cool. Chuck, I want to thank you. I know we're going to keep this conversation going. You're going to keep course. coming on Top Story and on all the platforms of NBC News, but I want to thank you because serving as moderator of Meet the Press, I mean, I believe it's a public service. So many people turn to you when they, they want answers, they want to figure out what's going on, and you were there every Sunday for us. So, Chuck, a big thank you for all the viewers, all right, including friend. myself. Thank you, sir. Yep. You're the best. Still ahead tonight, a major update on a building collapse in Iowa. The two construction errors investigators now say caused the partial collapse that left three people dead in May. Plus, new police body cam footage shows the moment police stopped a top federal prosecutor who was accused of DUI and hit and run. When he tried to hand one of those officers, that could get him in even more trouble. We'll show you that video. And an alert to Apple users why the company says you should update your devices right now. We will explain. Stay with us. Top story just getting started on this very busy Friday night. Okay, we are back now with a high-profile federal narcotics prosecutor accused of driving drunk. Police body cam video shows the veteran attorney giving his business card to the arresting officer as if to leverage his status within the DOJ to his advantage. We have that video and the latest details on his arrest. How are we doing, sir? Good, how are you? Tonight, a federal prosecutor on the other end of the law, yeah. hand handing an officer his business card during a hit and run investigation. Joseph Rudy, is that you? That's me. Are you an active I'm assistant? I am. U.S. State Attorney? Joseph Ruddy, a prolific federal narcotics prosecutor, apparently drunk and trying to leverage his status at the DOJ. He's accused of drunkenly striking a vehicle and leaving the scene. So, you realize when they pull my body worn camera footage and they see this, this is going to go really bad. So, yeah. As long as we're on the same page as that. Ruddy's blood alcohol level tested at 0.17% twice the legal limit. The officer's body-worn camera video first obtained by the Associated Press, capturing the prosecutor stumbling as he hands over his insurance card. Uh, you understand why I'm here? Uh, I had an accident. You did? Why didn't you stop? I didn't realize it. A different side of the attorney known for being tough in the courtroom, renowned for his role in Operation Panama Express, a task force targeting cocaine smuggling at sea. A spokesperson with the Department of Justice telling NBC News, quote, while we cannot comment on personnel matters, we are aware of the report and take all allegations of misconduct by department personnel seriously and take appropriate action where warranted. Now he's charged with a misdemeanor for driving under the influence. We reached out to Ruddy's family, who declined to comment. You hit a vehicle and you ran. Okay. You ran because you're drunk. You probably didn't realize that you hit the vehicle. Am, am, am I right? And that yes. All right, Ellison joins us now live in studio. So I guess the question is, is Ruddy still working with the DOJ? As, as far as we know, the answer to that is yes. When we asked that question specifically to the Department of Justice today, a DOJ official said that he had been suspended from his supervisory role, keyword supervisory there, on July 11th. Uh, according to the Associated Press, he was in court representing the United States as recently as a week ago. That DOJ official also told us they have referred this case to the office of the inspector general, and they're going to be investigated. Okay, hope we get some help. All right, Ellison, we appreciate it. When we come back to the rescue, video shows the moment a police officer outside of Philadelphia jumped into a river to save a 12-year-old inside of a sinking truck. What caused the father and daughter to plunge into the water? Stay with us. All right, we're back now with Top Stories News Feed and a major update on that deadly collapse in Davenport, Iowa that happened in May. Investigators concluding the removal of bricks from a bearing wall and a failure to properly support that wall during repair work caused the, caused the partial collapse. The report finding the contractors mistakenly identified the wall as non-structural. That collapse killed three people and seriously injured a fourth. A Pennsylvania police officer hailed a hero for saving a girl and her father on Labor Day. Newly released body cam video showing the officer jumping into the water after a truck rolled down a boat ramp into the middle of a river outside of Philadelphia. The 12-year-old girl in the bed of the truck, unable to swim, 
her father trying to save her from the sinking vehicle, the officer eventually guiding them to shore. Neither the girl nor her father were hurt. That's pretty incredible. And a security alert for iPhone users. Apple issuing an emergency warning to update devices after a security issue was discovered. It allowed hackers to invade iPhones, iPads, and Apple Watches. Experts say in some cases, the hackers are installing the spyware Pegasus onto devices, but that will be prevented with this iOS update, so make sure to do that. Okay, turning overseas, historic rainfall in Hong Kong paralyzing the city. It's washing out roads and flooding buildings. The deadly storm is the heaviest in the area in over a century, leaving more than 100 injured. NBC foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea has the pictures. Tonight, a once-in-a-century deadly deluge slamming Hong Kong, bringing the city to a grinding halt. The record rainfall, the heaviest Hong Kong has seen in 140 years, killing two people and injuring more than 100. Desperate rescue missions are now underway as emergency response teams pull stranded residents out of submerged cars, wading through waist-deep waters to get to safety. Rushing waters turning roads into rivers and inundating entire subway stations, forcing schools, businesses, even the stock exchange to shut down. The mega monsoon wreaking havoc on the city's infrastructure, collapsing roads, flooding malls and triggering landslides. City officials issued a black rainstorm warning, the highest level possible for over 50 hours, the longest in the city's history. Hong Kong's chief secretary warning residents of the storm's severity, announcing the extreme conditions are expected to persist at least until midnight tonight. Residents here in utter shock after witnessing the dramatic downpour. One woman saying even during previous typhoons, it was never this severe. It's quite terrifying to see. The extreme weather system hitting southern China just hours before, flooding the coastal region of Shenzhen, shutting down roads and public transportation and forcing 11,000 people to evacuate. As flood warnings continue across the region, thousands of residents in Hong Kong and China still waiting out this relentless storm. Kelly Kobiea, NBC News. And coming up, the urgent manhunt in the UK, a terror suspect on the run after escaping from a prison kitchen. New video of the delivery truck authorities believe he strapped himself to in an effort to escape. That's next. Welcome back. Time now for Top Stories Global Watch. And we begin with that terror suspect still on the run in the UK. Officials say this surveillance video shows the food delivery van used by Daniel Khalif to escape a London prison. Authorities believe he strapped himself underneath the truck before it exited the prison's kitchen where he was working. He's accused of planting fake bombs at a military base where he was stationed and possibly sharing information with foreign enemies. In Ukraine, a race to save survivors following a missile strike in a civilian area. Body cam footage shows first responders pulling people from the rubble in a city about 90 miles south of Dnipro. At least four people were killed and dozens injured in that attack that officials say targeted high-rise apartment buildings, office buildings, and one house of worship. And North Korea says it launched a nuclear attack submarine. But take a look. The submarine unveiled at a ceremony that was attended by North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The country's state-run news agency says it was capable of launching nuclear weapons. However, South Korean authorities say they doubt that submarine even works properly. Okay, back here at home in the States, tonight marks one month since those deadly wildfires tore through Maui. And after so much devastation, many in the community are still looking for a way forward. Here's Sam Brock. In a traditional Hawaiian paddle out, the sounding of the shell, or poo, is a call to ancestors and a spiritual cleanse. We just want to come together as, as a community and, um, and have a time for us guys to heal, have a moment in, in the ocean. Hundreds of participants paddling by board and in boats. I feel like the Hawaiian spirit was alive with us. Today, mourning the loss of life in Lahaina, Hawaii's historic capital, touched by historic flames. This is about everybody. Robert Cotter escaped with his wife and just the clothes on their backs. His son saw someone pass away before his eyes. Every, you know, the sound of a siren, the sound of wind, hearing a fire truck go by, 
it, it's you're on full alert. The significance of one month since the fires is hard to overstate. Officially, 115 lives have been lost. And according to the governor, more than 60 people remain unaccounted for. We feel comforted that at least our uncle was verified and that we know that he was found. Unfortunately, not everybody has that. Several weeks ago, we met Pakalana Phillips, who lost her uncle, Leroy. Today, she knows more than 10 people who haven't been located, but draws strength from the sea of support. There's so many people that are not just um, praying for us, but grieving with us. Hawaii's residents see water as a source of vitality, life. We're going to keep loving and taking care of each other. And right now, it's also the backdrop for a deeper connection. Sam Brock, NBC News. That does it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.